you're back. Alrighty, how you doing, man? I'm How's doing great, man. I know, man. It's been too long. I'm ready to get into this podcast, bro. Yeah, you know, we've been away for a couple months, but the off season's kicking in full gear and less than a hundred days until kickoff. So the off season content is gonna be pumping out. Um today we got in the lab we got Texas. Um before we get into this podcast, though, we'd like to offer our condolences to the Ellinger family. If you are unaware, Jake Ellinger, the brother of Sam, passed away on May 6th, um, a few days after his brother was drafted into the NFL. Uh, no cause of death was announced. Um, we're not going to speculate on any f- information there, and and nothing has been announced really in terms of details, but we would just like to offer our condolences to yeah. him. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a terrible thing, you know, right after, you know, Sam in one of the best, you know, moments I would assume in that family's life to, you know, see Sam Ellinger drafted. And then the next few days, you know, Jake passes away, you know, my condolences to the Ellinger family and, you know, anybody who knew Jake, my heart goes out to you. It's, it's a very sad tragedy. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, I feel like they're going to be playing with a chip on their shoulder. They're going to play with an edge. You know, everyone spoke very highly of Jake and um, they're going to be playing, I think this season with him in mind. And, um, I agree. You know, so, you know, moving forward to this upcoming season for Texas, it was kind of strange. Tom Harmon, he was fired weeks after athletic director Chris Del Conte backed him saying he wasn't going anywhere. Texas went 7-3. and three. It was a kind of a late hiring. You know, my whole theory on this is that they wanted their guy in Sark, the Texas brass did. They really liked him. They didn't want to lose the opportunity to have him. And that kind of explains the change of heart because it really was a late firing. You know, Yeah, so late, it really was. Yeah, you know, so late that Tom Herman, he's an offensive analyst with the Chicago Bears right now, you know, because all the jobs were taken. I expect him, you know, probably land a college head coaching job next off season. But that just shows you how late it was. Do you kind of agree with that theory that they really liked Stark or you think it was just something else? Man, I, I don't know. I mean, the the Herman firing just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I, I guess you could say that he underwhelmed a little bit considering the talent he had. I mean, I thought that, you know, the 2018 recruiting class that Texas signed was going to be was going to emerge into possibly one of the best defenses in the Big 12. It hasn't done that. And I think, you know, Herman never really adjusted to that. And I think that they're going to go with Sark because he's been there at Alabama. He's, you know, if he can possibly bring a solid defensive scheme to Texas, then that will be it. Because I don't think Herman was fired because of his offensive woes. Uh, Maybe they thought, you know, Herman couldn't succeed without Ellinger. But I think that's kind of weak because chance to succeed without Ellinger but I, you know it's a weird hiring I think I don't think Steve's a bad hire though but my question is can he handle the pressure yeah you know if all they have in place it's not you know a terrible hire a little questionable you know, he brings a good staff with him Kyle Flood the former Rutgers head coach and P- Pete Kowitakowski to coordinate the defense you know mm-hmm. um, but mainly he's going to be brought in to you know handle the offense um you know, when Tom Herman was in town, the offense, you know, at times it's like he just kind of was inconsistent. You know, yeah. last year they were they scored over 42 points a game last year. They're among the nation's best in offense. Their defense wasn't bad. It was a 7-3 season. So, you know, it really was an interesting firing that happened yeah. so late. So, you know, I'm really not sure if we're ever going to get really to the bottom of what happened there. But regardless, Steve Sarkeesian, he's brought in. You just saw what he did last year as the Boyles Award winner, top assistant in college football. Mm -hmm. I really like what Texas has on offense. I'm really excited to see this unit. And, you know, you start with replacing Sam Ellinger. The guy did it all as a runner, a passer. Mm -hmm. But I really like the two guys they have in the battle, Casey Thompson and Hudson Card. Would you like to elaborate a little bit on those two guys? Well, Casey Thompson, I, you know, I've watched, I watched the Texas uh, Colorado bowl game and I thought that he just played amazing. And I thought that he, I I can't say that he locked in, you know, a potential starting spot because now Tom Herman's not there, you know, Hudson card and Casey Thompson are on an even plant, even playing field from here on out because of Steve Sarkeesian. Now I think Thompson could be the starter, but I'm not going to count out Hudson card because he was one of the highest recruited quarterbacks in uh, what class of 20, correct? 2020, yes, he was the number two yeah. dual threat. You know? Yeah, so I mean, he's a he's one of the top recruits, and you can't count him out. But Casey Thompson, he's definitely given Sark something to think about because of his his talent. I think he's a better. I mean, they're both really dual threat quarterbacks, but I think Thompson's athleticism he'll, he'll probably emerge as the top guy just because Sark might want to go with the bet. Yeah, you know, Card, he was second rate dual threat as I just previously mentioned. The only guy who ranked higher than him was Bryce Young. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I was watching the Texas film against Colorado. Casey Thompson played the entire second half. And, you know, it wasn't like he had, you know, the keys just handed to him, you know, do your thing, take some risks. It was a close game, 17-10 to 10 coming out of halftime. 
He went eight of 10, 170 yards, four scores, and they weren't short touchdowns either. You know, he stepped up in the pocket and made through oh, yeah. the field on three of those. There was a play that stood out on third down where he had a free rusher on the right side. He sidestepped it, made a great throw over the linebacker. He just has a lot of confidence throwing the ball. And as a runner, you know, I'm really excited to see what Thompson can do with Stark as his offensive coordinator because they're going to add a lot of wrinkles like him and his talent, whoever is the starter involved. Yeah, and, you know, whatever, yeah, like you just said, whoever the starter is, they are possibly going to have one of the best receiving cores in the Big 12. And, you know, this is – this is up there with Oklahoma, I'd say. You know, I mean, they have Jake Smith, Josh Moore, and then they've got a guy that's really emerging as a Swiss Army Knife type guy in Jordan Whittington. On top of that, they signed uh, two top 247 receivers in Jaden Alexis and Xavier Worthy, who flipped his NLI from uh, Michigan. And I think these guys are going to uh, – Worthy especially will pr- – uh, push for early playing time. And I think all these guys are going to be great for Thompson or card or anybody else that can emerge as the starting quarterback in this off season. It's not just the receiving core. though; it's the entire offensive support. Oh cast. yeah, absolutely. You know, you got Bijan Robinson who his numbers I'll read here in a second, but also he'll be sharing the backfield. Roshan Johnson, a former quarterback. He's had over one mm-hmm. K yards, 13 touchdowns and two works as a second option. He's been very reliable as that number two. Keon yeah. Tangram is out. He transferred the USC. Mm-hmm. So you got that there's two guys you can focus on. But um, you know, B. John Robinson last year, he didn't really get involved till later the later half of the year, but on hundred touches, he had eight hundred and ninety-nine yards and six touchdowns. He also had two hundred and twenty-three yards and two hundred and twenty yards in the final two games, twelve touchdowns each in both games. The guy's just an explosive elite playmaker, really, from what I've saw so far. Yeah, B. John is really going to explode this year. And that's one of my that's one of my things that I really hope Sark doesn't go you know, pass heavy. I thought that he did a really good job of incorporating Najee Harris in the offense with uh, Mac Jones. But I think that, you know, now they have more of a, I think that they have more balanced backfield that with uh, B. John and, and Roshan. So I'm curious to see how they split the touches between those two guys, or if Sartre decides to go with a starter in, you know, I would assume B. John Robinson, because he really took over the reps last year. Yeah, it's kind of an unknown what the running game will do. Because, you know, at Alabama, they had that exceptional offensive line. So, of course, you know, Texas, they're not going to have an offensive line like that. It's just simple yeah. as that, at least not this early on in his tenure. Oh, um, I really like the one-two punch they have. And you got Thompson as well, who we already just mentioned his athleticism. You know, three guys you can put back in the backfield all together, right. run whatever. And, of course, Jordan Whittington, you said, I just really like the wrinkles that Stark had last year in his offense. They get Devontae Smith in one-on-one situations, got the ball to Najee Harris out of the backfield as well. Very, very exciting to see what this offense could probably do. Yeah, and it's it's not like he's lacking any weapons either. I mean, that's the thing is he comes into a very good offensive situation. You know, I thought that, you know, Tom Herman would have sent – going back to Tom just really quick, I thought Tom would have done fine with what he has right now. You know, Sam Ellinger left, but – it's not like they're lacking talent. I think, like I said, this could be one of the best offenses in the Big 12. And I, I would be surprised if they under if they underwhelmed. I would be very, very surprised. Yeah, at least offensively if they underwhelmed. Like right. you mentioned, Jordan Whittington, former five-star athlete. He's another one of those guys I can't wait to watch. He was limited mm-hmm. in 2020. He's going to take a big role this year. Especially with the wrinkles you mentioned. You know, He's going to be a guy that Sark is going to fall in love with, I would imagine. He's a guy that can really do it all. So, like I said, he's Swiss Army Knife, and that's exactly what Sark needs in this offense. Yeah, you know, jet sweeps, you know, slot, you know, or slants rather, you know, put him in the slot to run routes. I feel like he can pretty much do it all. We'll see what, how they incorporate him, but very exciting stuff, you know. Uh, I, just one more note on the receivers. I, a guy that I, I forgot to mention, a former walk-on, Kai Money, a guy that really emerged last year as kind of a, a Hunter Renfro-esque guy. He had 10 catches for 76 yards and a touchdown in the spring game and caught most of his passes from a freshman quarterback, Hudson Card. But Kai Money is a guy that I think is just adds on to their receiver room. He can really fill in it at any position on the on the receiving core. And uh, it just goes to show the depth that they have of a walk-on that's now seeing playing time at a consistent level. Yeah, and having veterans like Joshua Moore and Jake Smith is really going to be helpful. Um, you know, Cade Brewer at tight end, another notable name. Brennan Eagles is gone. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the aforementioned Smith, 48 grabs over the past two years. He doesn't average much per catch, but he's a reliable guy you can go to on right. the second and third down. Um it's just a lot to break down with this offense. I don't think they can really miss it this year. I don't see why they can't average, you know, 35 to 40 points per game. Right. Um, you know, of course, there's going to be some growing pains potentially with a new head coach, but um, 
you know, we just have to sit and see. You know, I don't think that we're going to expect them to disappoint whatsoever on this side of the ball if all they have. I I would be actually pretty disappointed if they didn't average around 30 to 40 points per game. Yeah, that would be very underwhelming. If if they average less than 30 points a game, that I'd say that they underwhelmed terrifically because that's uh, the, the amount of weapons that they have. I mean, say the passing game doesn't excel. Well, you've got two great running backs that you can easily utilize. And if they don't, you, I mean, that's why this is, this is a really big deal on Sark because I think he walked into one of the best offensive situations. And if he's truly one of the best offensive minds in college football, he is going to take this Texas offense and run with it. Yeah. You know, one thing is this offense, posted great numbers last year another question would be how good can they make them because you know this isn't out you know this isn't alabama they're not going to be you know just straight blasting everybody in the mouth yeah, right so i don't think that's a fair expectation but you know they scored almost 43 a game last year their running game was a bit inconsistent so i found that number pretty staggering they had 118 yards of rushing in every game or above 118 and once Bijan joined the fold they're averaging 195 so they clearly you know they it's really just easy to show up he's going to put in his game plan I think these guys are going to execute no problem yeah you know moving to this defense this defense wasn't bad you know they get back under 70 percent of his protect production though linebacker Juwan Mitchell safety Caden Stearns and pass rusher Joseph Asai are gone those are both big time losses yeah uh I think that one of the best uh replacements though is probably going to be the safety area uh another a note from an offensive receiver uh, receiver Brendan Schooler a transfer from Oregon will be switching from receiver to safety and on top of that they will also have a freshman safety uh where is he uh JD Coffee he will he will produce a little bit to the safety room and then of course the boomstick BJ Foster so the safety room I think will be a okay next year defensive end though it's like that's a nice little topic right there yeah you know back to the second year real quick you know Texas they weren't great versus the past last year 108th allowed 266 yards per game but they do get those veterans like you said Foster along with Deshaun Jamison and Josh Thompson mm-hmm. and the added talent. You know, they've recruited actually really well. You know, Bob Stoops actually recently said that this team can compete immediately because they've had competitive recruiting classes, which is true. They have. They still pulled in a top 15 class after the firing of Tom Herman. Right. Which I think that's really impressive to speak. The, oh, you know, yeah. They, I think they're really impressed with the staff that's coming in. That's a hard thing to do with recruits. Learn yeah, about your staff and be able to still recruit very highly. And it goes to show the you know the prominence of Sark and the the name that you know he can really he goes in there and it's like hey look at what I did at Bama you can come do this here at Texas and I think the recruiting is just gonna explode from here on out. Yeah, I know. You know, um, start 46 and 35 as a head coach. You know, he's had his struggles in his past, but he certainly overcame them. You know, off the field issues. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I think that is behind him. That's not something that's going to affect. And it certainly, you know, they Chris Del Conte f- certainly felt it wasn't going to affect his judgment on this position either. I think, you know, that's, you know, with my friends and I, you know, I have a few friends that like Texas and we're all aware of, you know, Sark's issues in the past. And the Texas job is one of the most demanding for success. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the USC job, it's fair to say that's the same way. And mm-hmm. Sark struggled there. And of course it was, you know, due to his, but that's another big question that, you know, I really hope and I believe that Sark is past, you know, his off the field issues, but I really hope he doesn't get swamped under the pressure at Texas because I think you could possibly be under more pressure here to win than, you know, at USC once before. Yeah, those boosters in Austin, you know, they're rowdy. Any, anywhere really in Texas, they're rowdy, you know. Yeah. And start, a lot of critics alluded to, you know, his alcoholic problems coming from the pressure that came from that job, you know. So, of course, it's something that's going to be brought up. You know, I wish him the best. And I, I think mm-hmm. it's going to be him. You know, Me as well. Me as and well. considering Texas paid a $15 million buyout to Tom Herman, and then hired Stark on the same day. I he better that, be worth it. Yeah, you know, I think that um, I think that they totally have confidence in him. I think that his past is the past. Of course, it's going to be alluded to, but you know. Oh yeah. And you know, um, you know, back to the defensive side of the ball, a defensive end losing Joseph Asai is a big time. You know, they had one of the worst. They had one of the nation's worst pass rushers 
uh, pass rushes last season. No size production was off the charts. I think uh, you what was it? You were at that game where you were not in Stillwater. Oh you yes, cross. Yeah, yeah. Did actually, you, uh, I, I gave him a shout out. I was really close to the. See, here's the thing. I was I was on the Texas sideline. And uh, Osai was over there and taking a knee, and I was like, oh, I would kind of shout out some of the Texas players I knew just, just to say, and then they all kind of looked back and whatnot. But yeah, Osai had a great game against um, against Oklahoma State, and to see it, you know, right in front of me, it was it was really cool. I I really got to see that. Hey, this guy is. I think he was a steal in the draft. I truly do. I think that it was just a lack of performance on the defensive side of the ball at Texas. I think if they were a more well-rounded unit, I think Osai could have easily, you know, been a late first-round draft pick. Yeah, a few things I'd like to touch on. Three of his five sacks on the year came in that game. The next closest was two by any player. You know, so mm-hmm. why, only twelve total sacks are coming back from last year. That's you know, well, well under two per game. They're going to have to step up on that side of the ball. Um, defensive end Alfred Collins, defensive tackle Vernon Broughton. Those guys are incoming. Prince Dorba, the outside linebacker. So they got some reinforcements coming. You know, help is on the way. Yeah, and uh, they just signed a, uh, a five-star recruit in this class, uh, Jatavion Sanders, uh, who's, as a matter of fact, the cousin of Spencer Sanders. Uh, okay. Found that out from a buddy the other day. And uh, so, yeah, I think Jatavion is a really good athlete. Excuse me. He's a really good athlete, and I think he could possibly crack the defensive end rotation pretty early, especially considering how they struggled a lot last year. They're probably looking for a little bit more of competition, and if that five-star guy can, you know, kind of light a fire under some of these other guys' tails, then I think they'll see more production this year. Yeah, you know, something I'd like to touch on. You know, the de- the defensive numbers indicate they weren't as bad as they were. You know, um, they were twenty seventh in yards per play, five point two outs, and you know that's. 5.2 yards per play. That's pretty outstanding considering they ranked 101st in total plays. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the defense clearly was doing work, but I feel like their offense, you know, they're just, they were too good. They were scoring so much. The defense was on the field a lot, and, you know, they weren't very fundamentally sound, I guess, you know, when you're playing that much. And, you know, they you know, were I, tired, you know, they yeah, had to constantly rotate, well. and there's not much chemistry there. Mm-hmm. I think because they uh, didn't give up a lot of big plays. Yeah, no, they, they were, like you said, they were really good defensively you know in terms of the uh yards per play but this i think the you got to give a lot of credit to the one-two punch in moro ojimo and uh, keandre coburn i think we're gonna see a lot of good production out of uh two of the best nose tackles in the big 12 uh that's like that's what i'm saying i think i think they're possibly you know that that great combination and if sark you know his defensive coaches can really utilize them to their true potential texas's defensive line will look pretty good next year yeah i have full confidence in their front seven being just the same as it was last year or even better you know the linebacker demari and overshawn he mm-hmm. seven tackles and tackles for loss last year 68.0 Two force fumbles. They also had seven pass breakups. Guy really did a lot of everything. He yeah, that leader. he's a guy he's they bummed leader. down from safety, as a matter of fact, because their their safety room was just so loaded with Caden Stearns and B.J. Foster. They they needed Overshone's talent be on the field. Well, I mean, the guy's six four. Just put a little bit more weight on him, and then they put him at linebacker, and he's excelled. I think with the athleticism, yeah, he's probably mm-hmm. be, you know very overshadowed for sure in the Big Twelve. Um, you know, just. And Achilles Hill, their defense again was the pass defense and the pass rush, which you know they they go hand in hand, you know. So mm-hmm. you're not getting to the quarterback; you're giving him too much time to find somebody, and that's I mean, like right. you just said, it goes hand in hand. So because they need they to fix that up. up. They did not give up a lot of big plays deep. They only allowed 29 yards or points per game, 64th in yards per game allowed. So this defense was not terrible, um, you know. So people can understand what the uh, you know uh, problems with this unit were. Then, then they, they can understand. fix it, yeah. Yeah, you know, so I feel like a lot of Texas fans might understand and they would be frustrated with Tom Herman, but I feel like this unit was starting to reach its peak of sorts. That's what makes, you know, the, the firing just, just really weird, you know, because it seems as if this Texas team was finally, you know, it may have been Ellinger's last year, but I don't think it was going to set them back any further because I just thought Herman was going to really take that team to the next level. And it's, it's just a weird fire, man. It's It really is, and it kind of irks my nerves. Yeah, you know, 31-18 and 18 record all-time at Texas. He won all four of his bowl games, Um, you know, but I can understand it if my theory is somewhat correct. They wanted their guy. They're on the offense. Um, you know, similar type of coaches, though, is Sark and Herman, both offensive experts, Kobe or QB gurus. So um, mm-hmm. 
but you know, being at Alabama, I mean, Tom Herman was at Ohio State as well. But you know, being at Alabama, resurrecting now, you know, his career has probably led to some new discipline, you know, new things he can establish. The you know, because that's been a problem as well with Texas, you know, discipline, lack of toughness, I guess you could say. And I feel like that's maybe another area Sark could help improve them on. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, he went through the Nick Saban rehabilitation program, is you know what they that call really it. Helped and, a lot of guys. As well. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, you know. You go through Alabama and you learn under Nick Saban. You come out an entirely different man, coach, father, son, doesn't matter. You come out a different man. And I think I'm really hoping that, you know, Sark is going to be, you know, a better him and compared to, you know, his last time as a head coach. Yeah, you know, and I'm not going to ask you for – we're going to do Big Ten predictions some here, somewhere down the line here. I'm not going to mm-hmm. ask you for a complete record prediction on Texas. But this schedule, you know, it's not overly challenging. As You know, I see early in the year they host Louisiana. We saw what they did last year in the season opener. That could be a little tricky, not the game you want to open up against Billy Napier and the Raging Cajuns. Right. But their non-conference after that is at Arkansas and versus Rice. Do you see any trouble for Texas in these games? Or how do you kind of see the early season playing? Well, you know, me being a, you know, Arkansas kid, you know, I grew up around a lot of these fans. They're all high on Arkansas this year. I wouldn't put it past Arkansas if this could be their big win of the season just because Arkansas is coming off of a, an impressive year compared to, you know, years past. You know, they won all three S they won three SEC games. You know, I think it was three, two or three, but, you know, they performed a lot better than what people gave Pittman time for. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know, man. I, I, I could I'll say Texas. I'll say Texas. I don't know if Arkansas is ready for it yet, but I think it's a really good step in the you know right direction. Rivalry renewed between Texas and Arkansas. It's, it's going to be an exciting game, I'll think. Yeah, those first two opponents, I think I like Arkansas this year to showcase even more improvements on both sides of the ball. Mm-hmm. So I think those first two weeks, they're going to be playing you know, a good football team in Louisiana and a progressing team in Arkansas. So I think those first two weeks, you're really going to see what you have with Texas this season, those first two weeks, to see what's been implemented and how, you know, sort of how that dis- discipline yeah. toughness is. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not worried about Rice. Texas just chucked that up as a win. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a tune up. Um, you know, they had played at Iowa State and at West Virginia in the back half of the schedule. So if this team is in contention for the Big 12, those are going to be two tough opponents to have to get by. Yeah, it's, that's what I'm saying is, you know, one of these, I think the defense is going to have to step up in the Big 12 because there's too many high-powered offenses that we can expect, you know, from Iowa State, uh, Oklahoma State, and then Oklahoma, you know. And the defense is going to have to keep up with those high-powered offenses or else I don't know if they're going to have a chance in the Big 12 this year. That's what it's going to come down to. The Cotton Bowl has been my favorite rivalry over the past five years. I don't think they've had a single game that wasn't decided by single digits. Over yeah, that's five that's been years. a really good uh, series recently. And yeah, no matter how good or bad the Longhorns have been, they've always been competitive, old-fashioned hate. That's when it fires them up the best. We'll see if Sark can bring that out of them for the entire course of the season, something Tom Herman couldn't do. Right. So we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? I'm very excited to see what these Longhorns can do. Um, yeah, you know, I'm I'm really excited to see them. You know, I, I'm ready to see Sark in the, in the burn orange and for them to go out because – Hey, you said it earlier, less than 100 days in this college football offseason. I don't know about you, but this one seemed like it's went by pretty fast so far. You know, yeah, yeah. If for me, it, it just it just seems like yesterday was the national championship, and here we are, you know, mid-May. It's pretty crazy. I, I'm looking forward to it, though. I think there's a lot of, you know, good storylines to follow this offseason, and I'm really looking forward to, you know, how Texas progresses and seeing their following their quarterback race on, you know, just some recruiting sites here and there. Yeah, for sure. And if, you know, Bob Stoops went as far enough to say this team's ready to compete, I believe him. Can't oh, wait yeah. to see what they do. All right, so that's going to wrap it up for this episode. We'll be back over the course of the next couple of weeks with a bunch of off-season content with less than 100 days, as we've mentioned a couple of times. We're going to start pumping out content left and right. So make sure you guys leave a like, comment, subscribe. You don't want to miss it. All right, y'all take it easy. Yes, sir. Appreciate you, Ready.